This is Pastor Dean's Sermon Archive. Pastor Dean is author, speaker, and pastoral coach, and this is a collection of his sermons given at Living Faith Church in Hermiston, Oregon. In today's message, Pastor Dean shares with us the importance of having men in the church who will pass on the baton and rise up in spiritual leadership to lead the next generation. After you've listened to today's podcast, we would appreciate it if you would review it as your feedback helps others discover the podcast and find the life and freedom they are searching for in Jesus Christ. Now, here's Pastor Dean with today's message. I find it absolutely stunning that when you look carefully in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that when you look at the million and a half people that came out of Egypt going towards the promised land. Now think about that. That that is the size of Metro Portland. A million and a half people. Okay, think about how many people live in Metro Portland. That's how many people came out of Egypt. Two of them made it into the promised land. Now three if you count Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Okay. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb. Does that shock you? That out of a million and a half people, two made it? I, I just have trouble getting my mind around that. We don't know a whole lot about Caleb. Scripture doesn't give us a lot of information about him. He first appears in the Holy Scripture in Numbers chapter 13. When they're on the edge of the promised land and God tells Moses to send some spies in to spy out the land and come back and give him a report. And so he selects one man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Caleb is the representative from the tribe of Judah. And uh, they go into the land They spy out the land. They come back. And when they come back, 10 of the 12 spies go, we can't do this. We're like grasshoppers. And there are giants. Can you believe this? There are giants in the land. We better go back to Egypt. It is better for us back in Egypt. We like the leeks and the garlic and all that stuff back in Egypt. It was better for us there. We cannot go into the promised land. And Caleb along with Jacob, Caleb's the primary spokesman here, Caleb goes, do not fear. It is a good land. It is a large land, just like God promised. And and their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. Wow, isn't that awesome? Now, the next time that Caleb appears in Holy Scripture, from that occasion in Numbers on through the book of Deuteronomy, he's mentioned as one of the two that's going to go into the land, but we're not told anything about him for 45 years. And 45 years later, he shows up again in the book of Joshua, and he, he comes to, to Joshua and he says, Joshua, you remember when we were spying out the land? God promised me that mountain. And I'm asking you, give me that mountain. I'm 85 years old now, but I want you to know I'm as strong as I was when I was 40. And I have the strength and power to go to warfare like when I was 40. And yeah, there are giants that live in Hebron and the surrounding community. But let me take that mountain. And at 85 years old, he leads his family in battle against those giants defeats them, and they take the city of Hebron and the surrounding communities, and that becomes the home for Joshua and his descendants at 85 years old. Come on! 85! And you thought at 85 you were supposed to be retired. 
No, God just wants to give you a new set of Michelins and say, come on, let's get the land. Amen? It disturbs me when I see retired people and all they want to do is get in a motorhome and go from coast to coast. Do you realize how tired you're going to get of that and how old you're going to get sitting behind that steering wheel? It is time to catch a fresh vision. God's not done with you yet. He's got a vision for you. And maybe you're 55 or 60 and you're looking forward to retiring. I want to ask you why. It's for more than going and buying a golf cart. God's not done with you yet. There is a kingdom to be crushed and a kingdom to be established. And you are a son and daughter of the living God. And he is not done with you yet. Come on. Okay, I'll stop meddling. We know a little bit more about Joshua. Joshua appears the first time in Scripture in the chapter that I've asked you to turn to, in Exodus chapter 17. There's an interesting story here. I don't have time to go into this. This is a whole other lesson. But the children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, and they have watched God destroy the the greatest army in the world at that time the Egyptian army is completely destroyed they're, they're now on the east side of the Red Sea they're headed for the promised land they stop at a, an oasis and the water is bitter they grumble God turns the water sweet they go to another oasis at Elim and at Elim, they, they, uh, they refresh themselves, renew themselves, and then they head on in to the wilderness of sin. When they get into the wilderness of sin, they don't have water. And they start grumbling, and they're ready to go back to Egypt again. And, uh, and God tells Moses, take your rod. I'm going to give them water from a rock. He gives them water from a rock. That's a whole other story. And reading that account, you see the problem. In the middle of that situation, they yell at Moses and they say, is God with us or not? Ever been there? Isn't it interesting how we, you know, God does something wonderful for us. We maybe have a miracle or he delivers us. He breaks a stronghold. Something happens. And, and, and we'll go, wow, God, you're awesome. And then right, in the, in, right after you have that wonderful miracle, it becomes a dead, dry place. And then on top of that, the enemy comes and attacks. And that's exactly what happens here in chapter 17. They're without water, they're thirsty, and they start grumbling, God, I thought you were with me. Don't look at me that way. You've been there. Come on. Let's be Christian enough to admit we've done that. Okay? And we get in that spot with God, are you? And God begins to provide us in a miraculous way. You go, oh God, you are with me. Yes, you are with me. And then right on the heels of that, the enemy attacks. What is up with this? God, I thought you saved me. I thought you redeemed me. How come we're under all of this attack? Folks, this is called normal Christian living. Normal Christian living is for the enemy to be continually fighting you and attacking you. Listen, abnormal Christian living is to live under defeat and depression. That's abnormal Christian living. Because the child of God is never at the mercy of his enemy. So in the midst of this attack from the Amalekites, this is where Joshua appears for the first time. God appoints Joshua to be the commander over the army. Joshua puts together this army to go and fight the Amalekites. Moses says, you lead them into battle. I'm going to go to the top of that hill over there. I'm going to pray for you. And as, as Moses is praying and his hands are lifted over the situation, the victory is there. He gets, his hands get tired and he goes, whew, 
boy, got to take a break. He takes a break from praying, and they start losing. Raises his hands again. He's interceding, and the victory's being won. His hands go down, and oh, man, there's nothing. So finally, Aaron and her go, Moses, we got to have you praying constantly. So uh, come on, stand over here. Come on, you're, 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 you're Moses for us this morning. Come on. Come on, give him a hand. This is Moses. Come on, her, you stand on that side. Okay. And this is what goes on. They stand here to go, Moses, you pray. We got your arms, bro. And they win the victory. Come on, amen? Does anybody know what that tells us? Thank you. Thank you, Mo. You're good. Anybody know what that tells us? No, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Here's the other thing. When you take a break from praying, the enemy starts winning. And there's some of you, that's the problem in your home. There's so much drama in your home because you're taking a break from praying. Get back on your knees. Come on, get those hands raised up over your children. Get those hands raised up over your marriage. Get those hands raised up over your finances. Get your hands raised up. Come on, come on. God, God will intervene. But it's by prayer, only by prayer. And there are things in your life, the only way you're going to win the victory is by prayer and fasting. And let me give you a hint. Fasting means don't eat. That's not fasting from your telephone. It's not fasting from Oprah. It's not fasting from, from your favorite activity. I mean, maybe you need to do those things. But come on, fasting means I am going to make this flesh suffer and be disciplined not to convince God. Fasting is not to impress God. You don't impress God with fasting. Fasting is getting you in alignment with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God doesn't change. He is the immutable God. He is the Lord God that never changes. And fasting is not to convince Him. Fasting is to get you lined up so that you have greater power and prayer and that you have a greater sensitivity to hearing the voice of Holy Spirit so you know how to pray in that situation. Come on, amen? amen. Prayer and fasting. And this is, where, this is where Joshua appears on the scene in the middle of this. Now, it's interesting because the next time Joshua appears, he has become Moses' right-hand man. He's not only commander of the army, but he is Moses' right arm. And he is with Moses going up to the mountain to meet with God. This is in, this is in Exodus chapter 24. God's called Moses back to the mountain. And as he's going back to the mountain, he takes Aaron with him and 70 of the elders. And an interesting thing happens. I mentioned this in last week's message. As they're, as they're getting on the mountain, the cloud of God's presence comes down on that mountain And Moses turns to Aaron and the 70 elders and says, you guys stay here, we're going into the mountain. And we're going into the glory of God. And Moses and Joshua walk right into that cloud of God's presence. And Aaron and the elders have dinner. Man, that doesn't make sense to me. Really? You're going to go in to the presence of Almighty God and I'm going to sit here and eat lunch? Really? Not on my watch. Are you kidding me? If you say to me, you know what, uh, Dean, uh, just want to let you know, uh, instead of going to lunch today, we're going to go and we're going to get with God because, man, we, God's presence is there. And I'm going, I, lunch has just lost all desire to me. I would rather be in the cloud of God's presence than eat. Come on. And as they're in the cloud of God's presence, God calls Moses into the center of his glory. And as he's in the center of God's glory, and Joshua is there watching, as he's in the center of God's glory, God says, now the Ten Commandments I gave to you back there in Exodus chapter 20. Um, Actually, he hadn't written the book yet. I'm just being silly, okay? Turn your neighbor and go, are you listening here? 
he writes it on, on a tablet of stone. He writes the Ten Commandments that God had already verbally given him. He writes them on stone for Moses to take down to the people. He also gives Moses all the instructions regarding the building of the tabernacle and the establishment of the priesthood. All of that is given to Moses. Joshua is there in the cloud of God's presence watching Moses right in the center of God's glory getting all of these instructions. In the meantime, while they're doing that, the people come to Aaron and go, you know what, we don't know where Mo is at, but man, you know what, we need, it. we need a different God. We really need a different God. Come and make us a different God. And Aaron listens to the people, and Aaron and the 70 elders go down from the side of the mountain. They go back among the people. They make a golden calf, and they start leading these people into the worship of this golden calf and into paganism and into all kinds of immorality and filth and debauchery. Moses is on the mountain getting the instructions, getting the direction from God. Joshua is there with him watching this going on. The children of Israel are going crazy down on the, at the foot of the mountain. When Moses comes back down from the mountain and they begin hearing the noise, Joshua goes, wow, sounds like there's a war going on down there. And Moses turns to him and goes, no, 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 it's not a war. That's not noise of victory or noise of defeat. That is partying. They are partying. And it it doesn't go well. That's the next time we hear about Joshua. The next time we hear about Joshua, just a couple of chapters over, Joshua is with Moses in the tent of meeting. And he's continually going with Moses to the tent of meeting, talking with God face to face. Moses gets done talking with God face to face. He goes out to do business. Joshua stays with God face to face. And the next time we see Joshua, he's going as a spy. The next time we see Joshua... He's the leader of Israel. God's appointed him leader of Israel. Moses is going home to heaven. Joshua is the leader. Now look at me right here. These two men are the model of what America needs today. America is right where Israel was when they were at the foot of the mountain and Moses was up praying. America is in deep trouble. America is in deep trouble. We know that. We see it every day, don't we? Okay? More upset. And we're seeing it. America is in trouble. And there's a reason, folks. We have thrown God out of the public arena. We have thrown the Bible out of school. We've thrown prayer out of school. We have thrown God out of our marriages. We have thrown God out of every public arena. We do not want God there. And God is a part-time God. He's there when we're in trouble and we cry out to him. But the rest of the week and on our Fridays and Saturdays, we want to party. And on most of our Sundays, we want to party. And we have lost our moral compass. We have lost our moral fiber. And it is because we have thrown God out. And when you throw God out, the enemy takes that vacuum as opportunity to bring in every kind of pagan deity he can. And when we throw God out, we throw out the compass of what is right, what is wrong. And the enemy takes that vacuum to bring in his moralities. Those of you that are old enough to remember, you will remember in the late 70s and on through the decade of the 80s, this was the mantra. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. There is a Greek word for that. Balanos. Folks, listen, all legislation is legislating someone's morality. And because we threw out the moral compass of God's holy word, now we are accepting the moral compass of enlightenment. We're accepting the moral compass of humanism, rationalism, materialism, pragmatism, relativism. 
Well, that is now our moral compass. If it feels good, do it. And so we are partying. And the only solution in the midst of this absolute moral upheaval is we must raise up some Joshua's and some Caleb's. Men who will have a moral fiber that will stand up and say, Do not fear. God has promised us a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And do not fear because their their protection is taken down and the Lord will be with you. When he delights in you, he will be with you and he will give you the land. Do not fear. And so we need... We need some spiritual leaders. Now, ladies, listen to me real closely right here. I'm not demeaning you right now. I am not diminishing your value and your significance. I am not making you less. But it is time in this pagan, immoral, wicked World where the spirit of Jezebel is running rampant. It is time for the women of God to acknowledge God meant for men to be spiritual leaders in the house of the Lord. I know that is politically incorrect and it may be offensive to your tolerance. But I'm going to tell you what tolerance is all about. Have you noticed they are tolerant for everyone except those who refuse to call evil good and good evil? They're tolerant for everyone except for those who want to mention the name, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior of mankind. They're tolerant of everyone except those who believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And there's a reason. It is because tolerance is out of the spirit of hell. Because tolerance was used in world, before World War II. It was used in Germany to demean everything except what Hitler believed. Tolerance was used in uh, the Assyrian Empire. It was used in the Babylonian Empire. That's what got Daniel thrown into the, to, to the lion's den. Tolerance is out of hell and it is used to stop the people of God from standing for right and standing for truth and standing for moral purity and standing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, we must stand for the living God in this time. And sir, we need you to rise up and be a man of God and to be a spiritual leader. Not the kind of leadership Aaron gave. That's the kind of spiritual leadership that is being found in the majority of churches today. Aaron's. They will preach what the people want to hear. They will preach in such a way that they won't offend the big givers. They will preach in such a way that they don't, oh boy, they don't want to disturb and, 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 and have people think that, 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 well, you know, okay, I'm not tolerant. They, they are preaching In a way that is exactly what Paul said would happen in the last days. People have itching ears. And they want to please the ears of the people. And so they heap up to themselves teachers who will not teach the absolute truth. And I want to tell you that kind of spiritual leadership will destroy families. It will destroy marriages. It will destroy the power of the church. It will leave the church having a form of godliness, but no power. And dear ones, it is time. It is time for the church 
If you're going to put up a sign that says you're the church of the living God, if you're going to put up a sign and say that you're a house of God, if you're going to put up a sign out front that says God is here, then it is time to make sure that God's presence is in the house. It is time to have men who know how to bring the presence of God into the house. And if you're not going to do that, take the sign down and put up rotary. Put up some other social club because you're not the house of God. You're just a social club. It is time the church has got to be the church that is strong enough to push back hell. Strong enough to to defeat disease. Strong enough to bring deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And to bring the acceptable year of the Lord. That is what the church must be. I told you this is a turning point. And men, you've got to lead the way. Boy, it's silent in here right now. We need men that know how to meet God. Do you know how to meet God, sir? I truly believe Joshua didn't know how to meet God. And so he began hanging out with the guy who knew how to meet God. And I want to tell you something. One time, one time, in the glory of God that it's so strong, you can't stand up. All you can do is get on your face. And you'll never be the same. And when you're not walking there, you'll keep wanting to be there. And your heart will keep convicting you to get back there. One time. See, that to me is why youth camps are so important. Folks, it's all about getting kids into the presence of the living God and experiencing the glory of God to create in their heart a thirst that they will never want to live without that, that they will seek to live a lifetime with that in their heart. That's what happened to me. July 3rd, 1964. This kid who was filled with hate, filled with bitterness, I was mean, I was violent, I was evil to the core. And I found myself running down to this big old altar down front at Sanders Camp, Idaho, in a free Methodist youth camp. Actually, it was a family camp. There were as many adults there as teenagers. And I'm in the altar, and I'm praying, and I, I, I prayed what I knew to pray, which was nothing. I didn't, I didn't know anything about anything. I just pray, oh God, I, I, want, I want you to save me. I want you to fill me with your love. And that was all I needed to pray. I started to get up, and this big old hand felt like it was, it was the size of, of a giant just pushed me back down. And this is what I heard. Pray till you get through, son. Pray till you get through. So I got down on my knees. I prayed the same thing all over. You know what's to pray. I got done with that prayer. I started to get up. Pray till you get through, son. Pray till you get through. <clears throat> To this day, I have no idea who it was. But I started, I prayed the third time, started to get up. Pray till you get through, son. Pray till you get through. That moment I met God. And he revolutionized my life. And I've never wanted anything else since. Uh, there's, there's been some times I maybe haven't walked as close as I could have, should have. But I want to tell you something, my heart's always been after him. And I want to speak for a moment to the, to the young men, 14 to 18. I want to tell you something. God, God desperately wants you to rise up as a man of God from your youth. Amen. You don't have to wait tell you're an old guy to get this you know all I knew was Jesus saved me but I started speaking at youth events and by the time I was 19 churches were inviting me to come and do evangelistic meetings I, I, I only had three sermons get saved Jesus is coming and get baptized in the Holy Spirit that's uh, because that's, that's all I knew get saved Jesus is coming again so you better get ready 
and get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I only had three sermons. Didn't matter where I went in the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. You got one of those or all three of them at once. Because that was all I knew. I was only 19. That's all I knew. Young people, listen to me. I want to tell you. It's just as much of a fire in me now at almost 68 as it was when I was 18. And I'm asking you to turn your back on the world and run to Jesus and let him set your heart on fire. I want to... This is... I. I'm away from my sermon, and I, I'm just going to go where I feel God's taking me. I want to speak to the men. I, I want to speak, first of all, to those that are 20 to 45. Sir, what your family, what your marriage, what your workplace, what you need more than anything else is you need to learn how to be a man that knows how to get to the face of God. Learn how to get to the face of God. And reading a little two-paragraph devotional in the morning and then praying, God bless me today, and out the door you go, that will not get your family there. That will not get you there. Sir, plan your day, which means you're going to plan when you go to sleep at night so that you get enough sleep that you can get up early enough in the morning that you get a minimum of 15 to 20 minutes. 30 minutes would be better with God. And you read a portion of his word and then you spend time praying until you know you've met God and he's met you and if you can't do that in 15 minutes then stay there longer get up earlier and stay there longer but start your day in the presence of God because here's what will happen when you start doing that you will have a wisdom on the job site other guys don't have you will be able to figure out problems on the job others won't be able to figure out you're going to have answers to what's going on in your marriage answers to what's going on with your kids you're going to have answers to what's going on and, and, and to show you how to handle your finances I'm telling you you must have the wisdom of God and the way you get the wisdom of God is you learn how to get to God face to face I I find it shocking to me that the average pastor in America spends less than 10 minutes a day in prayer I don't know how they do it. It, it, Apparently, it's just a business. But I want to tell you something. And will you stand with me, please? Go to the next slide for me, would you please? I'm sorry. Go back. You were at the right one. I apologize. These young men, these young men that are 35 and under, won't know how to get to God if there are not older men that can model it for them. I learned how to pray by listening to old brother Johnson pray. Now, I'm telling you, as a teenager in high school, I thought he was older than dirt. I knew he had to be at least 100. He wasn't, but, you know, when you're that young, they look that old. I probably look that old to young people today. But I want to tell you what would happen. Pastor Bullock, a man of God, he would be in a service, and he would kind of feel... A little bit like I have felt this morning. Coming with this message that I knew was going to be a hard message for you to hear. That was going to be a message that would get in your face. 
And he would stop and he would turn. And, and old brother Johnson always sat three rows back on this side. One chair in. And he would say, brother Johnson, pray. And Brother Johnson, he always, he always did it this way. He'd kind of lean on that pew in front of him. And he would begin going, oh, God. Oh, God. And there was nothing phony about it. And by the time he got to that third time, oh, God. You would begin feeling a presence that would take your breath away. And he'd begin praying. And God would come down in the house. I was one of the weird teenagers. I'd go to Wednesday night prayer meeting. And it really was a prayer meeting. And I would be there. I'd be praying. And I'd wait till I knew when Brother Johnson was going to pray. And he'd start praying. And oh man. It would move your heart. And I'd go home and try to pray like him. I'd use his same words. Of course, it didn't work very well, but, but it taught me how to pray. And it taught me to want God. I need the older men in this house to model for our young men how to want God, how to seek God. They need to see you here for our pre-service prayer time. If you got to have a cup of coffee before you pray, get here at 8.30, get a cup of coffee and be ready to pray by 10 after 9. But they need to see that. They need to see you praying, feel you praying. They need you to hang out with you so they can know how to be a man of God. We need that. Young men, just because they got gray hair or no hair doesn't mean that they're outdated and antiquated and they belong in a museum. What that means is you should hang with them and learn what they know so that you can become a man of God. You can become a Joshua and a Caleb. The answer to America. The answer to America. is not more men that know how to hunt. And know how to fish. And know how to get the big game. And come home with the big horns. And come home with the big fish. They don't need more men who are radical about an NFL team or an NBA team. They don't need more men that are crazy about Xbox. Let me tell you what America needs right now, sir. They need men of God who live a holy life that is eye-scorching holy for God. America's women need to be able to see men whose eyes do not look where they don't belong. And when they see gals showing way too much cleavage and way too much leg and way too much butt, they turn their face away and look away because that is not holy. And their eyes are seeking to be eyes that know how to be face to face with God. And it's eyes of holiness that look face to face with Almighty God. Men that know how to pray their sons and daughters free. Men that know how to lead with the wisdom of Almighty God and the mercy and grace of God. That when a son or daughter fails, they don't throw them aside and yell at them and call them names. Rather, they hold them and they hug them and they give them grace and they give them mercy and they give them love. And while they're doing that, they're staying up at night praying them free. I understand. I understand. 
I'm so thankful my three kids walk with God, but I want to tell you something. Every one of them faced a season where I knew they were being pulled by the world. And the only answer was I didn't get much sleep. As I saw the face of God and I cried out for them and I watched God break them free. I'll never forget one Sunday night, my son Aaron, I knew he was, he was being pulled. He was being pulled. There was some kids around him that was pulling him. And he, he was wanting to walk with God, but he was being pulled. And I knew his heart was cold. It had been going on for months. And night after night, I prayed for him. And one Sunday night, making a call like I'm going to make here in two minutes, he ran down the side aisle and fell on his face. And from that night, he never turned away again. Thank you for listening to Pastor Dean's Sermon Archive. If this message today encouraged you, please consider leaving a review or comment on his blog to let us know. You can follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and on Rumble. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and you can also find Pastor Dean's blog at fdeanhackett.com. Thank you again for listening.